Hello and welcome to day four of our online Zoology Live Festival from the Museum of Zoology. I'm Ros Wade, I'm the Learning Officer at the Museum and I'm your guide through this wonderful week of wildlife and I've been really enjoying hearing from all of our experts about our local wildlife. Now, huge, huge apologies for our technical issues that we had yesterday. We had some real problems with our internet connection. Hopefully that won't happen again today. Uh, but if you missed out on asking your questions about pond dipping to Francis Dipper or wildlife filmmaking to Ellie Bladen, fear not, because they will both be with us on Saturday. So tune in at two o'clock on Saturday for tips and uh, IDs and answers to all your questions uh, with Francis Dipper. And then at 3pm we'll be showing Ellie's film with top tips on making wildlife films and she'll be here to answer any of your questions 3 o'clock on Saturday. So please do join us then. And so to today's show. Today we will be exploring the wonderful world of British birds. Uh, Dr Tony Fulford will be taking us on a bird walk down the Fen, and Dr Andrew Bladen will be showing us some of the best ways to encourage birds into your garden. We will also be launching our Lego challenge today. This is where we are challenging you to create creatures inspired by our local wildlife out of Lego. It's really good fun and we would love to see your creations. Any creations that you send in as part of our Lego or Recycled Makes challenges will be entered into a prize draw for a Mini Beast Explorer kit. So it's really well worth doing. You can enter the competitions by either posting a picture on our social media using the hashtag Zoology Live or you can email them to us and there are details of how to do that on our blog. So back to Tony Fulford and he's going to be taking us on a walk along Wickham Road, listening out for all the different types of birds you can hear there. Remember Tony will be with us live after his film so do get your questions ready for him in the comments. So here I am in Upware, just on the edge of Wickham Fen. I'm about to head into a fen to try and record some birds. With me I have my parabolic reflector. And um, it's a little late in the year now, it's June the 14th. So a lot of the birds won't be singing quite so frenetically as they do earlier in the year. Along here, along the edge of the Wiccan Lode, there's always a lot singing on the opposite side of the bank. I can hear at least one black cap singing there now. There, that's it. I hear the high, almost bell-like notes. It's very characteristic. It's a very musical warble. I just heard along here, apart from the ubiquitous wren, there's a sedge warbler singing. Very buzzy sound. Let's see if we can catch that. There's the sedge warbler. You hear that much more manic song. Repeating notes over and over and over and then buzzing on to the next, next phrase. Here in contrast, we can hear the reed warbler. I suppose you say it is fairly excitable, but that repeating of the notes and nowhere near as buzzy is very distinctive. This is the chiff chaff. Surprisingly variable song, both of them you really got two notes. The monk jack deer barking in the background. I hear there's a there's always a song thrush singing around this area. 
that's it. It's another one that, that likes to repeat notes. But deeper, not as deep as a blackbird, but deeper than, than many of the warblers. Did you hear that little outburst? That's the Chetty's warbler. And the squawking of a black-headed gull. Actually, sadly, in this precise spot is where the nightingale sang last year and the year before. <coughs> it hasn't arrived this year, so um, I think it's possibly decided to give this one up. They're very fickle birds. They'll, they'll turn up one place, disappear again, just as soon as they can. Okay, there's the chat. Just to sound like a fast bowler running up and delivering his, his bowl. Yeah. Always a cuckoo tantalizing in the distance, that's it again. Black cats seem to have stopped. Sounds a little bit like a chaffinch. Sounds a bit like a black cat just down to my left here. This is that a garden warbler. Let's see, let's see if I can pick that one up. That's a little bit special. That's it. Oh, and a black cat in the background. The open area to the left here is a favourite spot for grass or warblers. There's definitely one singing out there, but it might be a little distant. Yeah, that's it. Just a reeling sound. The grass of a song tends to wax and wane as the bird rotates its head and projects the song in different directions. Now, just in the little copse to the left here, it's a garden warbler and the willow warbler. Pan through round to that. There we go, garden warbler immediately. And the willow warbler with its liquid cascade. Now, here we have a white throat singing really quite close by. in the focus of the paramotic. Right at the top of that, of a bare bush. Another willow warbler here. Let's see if I can pick this one up. And now I'm joined live by Dr. Tony Fulford. Hello, Tony. Hi, uh, Rose. Hi. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you for that wonderful film. It was really beautiful and a, a nice sort of moment of calm uh, going down to Wickham Fen there. 
Um, do you know why birds sing and why so early in the morning? Well, the main reason for singing, um, well, there, there are two reasons really. One is uh, to declare a territory and the other one is to attract a mate. So it's mostly the male that does the singing, but not exclusively. Um, why do they sing early in the morning? That's a bit more difficult to answer, but it's probably, again, it's more this sort of rivalry thing. Um, you know, one starts and they all, they all have to, to pile in. And it may well be that when they wake up in the morning, they, uh, <clears throat> they want to, to announce that they're still alive and their territory is still taken. Um, and um, of course, then the others have to, to join in, they have to reply. Um, uh, it's also, people also think that maybe early in the morning, it's, um, it may be dark, uh, just getting light, it's light enough to be able to sort of see what they're doing, you know, the threads are coming, but not, um, not uh, light enough for them to, to feed, so they might as well sing. And also the sound travels better in the morning, well, it's supposed to anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yes. I always think it's um it's a wonderful thing to do to go out on a dawn chorus walk. I've really enjoyed it when I've I've managed to get myself out of bed early enough to go and, and listen to the birds uh, in May or something. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I love doing it. Yeah, yeah. Just, to, love taking people on, on guided walks. It's, it's always very appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Um, I noticed you took a parabolic reflector out on your walk with you. Can you explain what that does and sort of how it works? Yes, and I've got the thing behind me here somewhere. Um, there we are. I don't know whether you can see it actually, because it's transparent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, it's a, it's a polycarbonate sort of paraboloid, um, and it collects the sound and concentrates it in the centre here. So it collects it over a wide area and concentrates it into a small area, amplifies it. Uh, but it only amplifies it in quite a narrow um, range, so um, a narrow angle, about 10 degrees, um, which means you cut out all the annoying background, um, which is how I could, um, once I got it in the, in the, in the focus of it, I could, I could pick out those individual birds on the walk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do, you, do you have any other, <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other tips that you sort of recommend for people to have a go if they want to have a go at recording? Uh, yeah, well, the parabolic reflectors. Yeah, the reflector is quite um, quite an expensive bit of kit. You need to be really committed um, to to, uh, to buy one of those. I mean, it's not ridiculously expensive. I think mine costs about seven hundred pounds, something like that. And that's with mm -hmm. a nice preamp and all sorts. It's quite a nice piece of kit. Um, but um, cheaper things, you can buy some little microphones, a bit like this little pell. A lapel microphone on me here. Um, yeah. So there's a pair of lapel microphone, they're called clippies, these ones. Mm -hmm. um, if you clip those either side of a tree trunk, you get a wonderful stereo sound. And then you uh, obviously you've got to record it on something and yeah. um, something like a little audio recorder, recorder, which you can pick up for next to, well, you can pick them up on eBay pretty cheaply. There's varying qualities, of course, but um, the, I like these Olympus ones. The Olympus mm -hmm. LS11 is a nice one. Uh, it's got a good preamp in it. Uh, so you, you plug it in, pin it to your tree, hide it inside a, a, a waterproof bag <laughs> yes. um, always and leave it, leave it, always a, always a good idea, yes, um, um, and leave it overnight um, and say that these, well you, you can actually make these yourself um, from, from the little capsules inside but um, to buy the whole thing already wired up for you is, is about 50 quid, I think, something like that. Okay, well, that's quite reasonable. Um, yeah. So, so yes, and then what you can do, you can, oh, the, oh, I should, should mention that the, these run on AA batteries and they will run for um, for 12 hours at least, um, which is quite something. So that means you can leave it overnight and come back the next to, day and you know, spend, don't have to spend the rest of the day in the morning. working out what yeah. you've got. No, exactly, although it yeah. is lovely to do that, but nevertheless, yes. um, you can't always do it. <laughs> So we've had a number of questions come in from the audience. Um, when do you mm -hmm. How do you know the different bird sounds? So how do you know them? 
How do you know? How can you learn the sort of the different bird songs? Because I keep trying and I'm not it's, very good at it. It's difficult. It's a question I get answered uh, asked over and over. Mm -hmm. And there's an airplane going over. I hope that's not roaring too much in the background. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's difficult, um, but it's persistence is really what it's all about. Um, you start off with the common ones, you know, get your blackbird and robin under your, under your belt, as it were, and then go out with your ears open, basically, um, and, and listen, and listen for something that's not, not familiar, and find out what it is. And of course, recording it, um, and, um, you know, then listening back to the recording and, and examining it and try to work out what it is. That's a great way of learning, you, you know, you, it's much more, it's much less passive, it's much more um, active and people learn things better that way. Yeah. But a lot of people tell me their hearing isn't good enough. Well, my hearing's not, it's not bad, but it's not brilliant. You don't need really good hearing. Um, and um, if you, that's what I, I say, is if you can learn your friends' voices, you can learn the bird songs. It's just a matter of becoming familiar with them. Um, somehow you'll pick it up. It's very hard to say exactly what it is, but you know, what they are. It's, um, yeah. it's the same, same as you couldn't describe a friend's voice mm -hmm. in, in, yeah. in a way that would identify them with us. You, you're, never, you're always certain. So that's, that's what happens. That's, yeah. that's how it works. Practice then. Listen in the Practice, I'm afraid, yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. Get, get out there in the field. Yeah. <laughs> so we've had another question. This is from Gilby, aged 11. If you had a mm -hmm. chance to see any bird out of a Montague's Harrier, Benelli's Eagle, Booted Eagle, <laughs> Or short-toed snake eagle. You know, which of those would you like to see? Because I'm a fan of birds of prey. There. <laughs> I think so. Yes. I mean, funnily enough, I'm not a big fan of birds of prey, largely because they make rather pathetic little noises. Um, <laughs> but um, um, well, I've seen some of them. I've seen the snake eagles and so. Um, but um, uh, Montague Harrier. I think. Let's say that. I like Harriers. They've, they've got a bit of bit of style somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't go for rareness in particular. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. um, do you also know what the birds look like? And um, yeah, so there's somebody asking, how do you know all the sounds, but do you also know what the birds look like if you were to see one? Well, yes, I do, of course. Um, I don't rely on it very much. And I know that uh, I've got a lot of birdie friends and they know what they look like a lot better than I do. They know mm -hmm. every last little feather tract, but um, um, I, no, <laughs> I don't. I rely more on that, um, on, on hearing them, particularly for the, um, the songbirds. So, for instance, I do a, a, a survey for the BTO, on surveys for the BTO, but there's one mm -hmm. that many bird watchers do, which is the breeding bird survey. Um, I do that every year. and. Um, I would say I would identify 90% of the birds by hearing them rather than, and, and, and probably 80% don't even see them at all. So, um, yeah. so you get a, it's a much better way of identifying them, to be perfectly okay. honest. Yeah. yeah. So um, Ivan K is saying, do you know every bird? And also J86 <laughs> is where can you buy the sound recorder? I think we've got some keen um, sound recorders. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. um, do I know every bird? No, clearly not. I mean, there are 10,000 of them. Um, in, not every bird in the world. I'm familiar with just everything that breathes in the UK, of course. Uh, I can't say I know all their songs. I haven't heard all their calls. Um, but most of the, yeah, I think all the songbirds I would know their, their, their call. Um, but of course, that, you know, it's just been built up over years, so it um, takes a long time to get that far. Um, so what was the other question? That, um, and where can you buy the sound recorder? Oh yes, of course. Um, eBay, I suppose, is the you know, yeah. That's yeah. where you can get them cheaper, and you, you can buy them all over the place. I, I tend to, I think, I bought every single piece of equipment I've got online. Um, yeah. It's easier to find them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. Um, we've got another question. If there comes a windstorm and birds forget their way back to home and all traces removed. Mm. Can they still get back to their homes? Uh, many can, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's a very different question. Um, it doesn't involve their sound and their, um, and their voice at all, but nevertheless, um, um, they, they have various ways of doing it. And many of them have a magnetic sense, so they kind of know which, which way 
they're pointed all the time. So they're always aware of that. So that's mm -hmm. kind of there with them all, as wherever they go. So even a robin, which doesn't go very far, still has a magnetic sense. So it doesn't get lost in the woods because mm -hmm. it knows which directions at least it's pointing in. Um, they apparently some use scent. They use um, many, many other maybe a sort of atmospheric pressure and all sorts of funny things like this they, they're very they they, they 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 need to they move around a lot more than mammals do mm, they yeah. need to use everything that they possibly can um so they do use a lot of different ways but of course they, they're fantastic memories many birds have phenomenal memories for, particularly for uh, geographic locations i mean one thing that's um um just tells you just how amazingly good they are uh, I used to work in the Gambia in, in Africa and I used to catch European birds occasionally uh, that would come down and then I put a ring on them and the next year I'd catch the same bird in exactly the same bush. It had found its way all the way back and that didn't happen once, that <laughs> many times, but they do and of course they, it's well known that they come back to breed in the same spot but yeah. they also winter in exactly the same spot so they, they memorise landscapes very well too. Yeah. So Rob K asks, what kind of place is the best place to build a bird hive? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> it's quite um, that's not something I've ever done, to be perfectly honest, mm -hmm. but um, it depends what you want to see. I mean, it's, it's what normally governs it. If, you, if there's something you're, if you're interested in seeing and you don't want them to see you, <laughs> um, build a bird hide where... Um, yeah, well, you've got yeah. a good view, basically. Yeah, um, good but if, if if you want one, maybe you're interested in seeing the maximum number of birds or something like that, in a good place, um, and as you will see in many bird preserves, a good place is uh, over, overlooking water. Because you'll get the, yeah. the land birds in and around, but you also get all the water birds, and there's usually a lot going on near water. Okay, okay. Zoe, age seven. Oh, just like that. Zoe H7 asks, how far away can birds hear each other? How good is their hearing? So I'm singing so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's an um, interesting question. Um, the hearing is not a lot better than ours. They can't hear as low as we can. Um, maybe it hear a little bit higher, but not that much higher. Um, some birds have phenomenal hearing. It's, it's, it's the usual thing. You know, all birds aren't the same. Owls have fantastic hearing because that's how they hunt their prey. Yeah. Uh, whereas um, songbirds, well, how far away can they hear them? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a how long a piece of street. It depends how, how loud the noise is. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah. But I mean, if you think about it, uh, 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 many songbirds will call in a mate um, from migration. The males arrive first. And so a nightingale, for instance, sings all night before it's mated. Um, and so he's calling in his mate from the skies. So probably from quite a long way up. Um, mm -hmm. But again, it depends on, on you know, what's, what's in the environment. And it's going straight up into the air. It probably travels quite well, but it's got to move through woodland. It, it gets some attenuated. So it's been asked, do you like seabirds? I mean, they don't have the most beautiful songs. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. It's true. Um, I, I kind of admire gulls, I have to say, mm. but it's not quite the same as like. <laughs> I love terns. Terns are beautiful. And one of my yeah. favourite birds is, um, is, the, is the shag. It just mm. looks so beautiful in its green, green eye and uh, it looks yeah. like a miniature dragon. It's just a fantastic <laughs> bird. Yeah. How, how good is bird eyesight? That's another question we've been asked. Again, quite variable, but mm -hmm. some of them are fantastically good. Um, I think probably they have better eyesight than we do, most of them. Birds of prey have have amazing eyesight. You see a, a kestrel hovering, I don't know, 100 feet up in the air, and it can see little movements of, of tiny voles on the ground. Um, amazingly good eyesight. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are good at, at, at um, in low light as well. So some birds with large eyes and robins and song thrushes, for instance, tend to be the first birds to sing in the morning mm. because they've got, they, they can see better in, um, in the dark. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you, have you ever seen a hummingbird? 
And I'm assuming not in this country. Yes. Or... Not in this country, no. <laughs> you won't see one in this no. country unless it's escaped from a zoo or something. Yeah. Um, but yes, I have seen them. I've seen them in Chile. I've, mm -hmm. I've not spent a lot of time in North America. Yeah. Thought it would be interesting to do so. And uh, what is the most common bird you've heard? Most common bird? Yeah. Well, um, you know, again, common is a different, difficult thing to define. Yeah. Um, the, the commonest in the UK is it's what people quite often think about. And there are there's three or four that go up and down according to you know, the latest survey. Wood pigeons are incredibly common. <laughs> robins, <laughs> are, 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 actually robins, are, uh, wrens are yeah. one of the most common birds. And chaffinches are very, very common too. Um, mm. But worldwide, what's the most widely distributed bird? I mean, funnily enough, it's the barn owl is incredibly widely really? distributed. This is, you know, it's all over the world, um, yeah. and including on lots of little sort of islands and so forth. They, they get about quite, quite a lot. I never knew that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you have a favourite bird song? Hmm. Always a tough one. I have to confess, I uh, always love difficult. Black birds. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I agree with you there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 probably it is the blackbird. Uh, the garden warbler is gorgeous too. I love yeah. the garden warbler. The nightingale is interesting. It's a nice song. As for a completely bonkers song, like the thrush nightingale, which if anyone ever gets a chance to go to somewhere in Eastern Europe and to listen to those, it's just. Mm -hmm. Just nutty. It sounds like a sort of out of control robot. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just crazy. It's a lovely song. Yeah. Um, Eveline, aged seven, asks Have you ever seen or heard an owl before and what does it eat? Owls? Um, I've seen quite a few species of owls, yes. Um, they tend to eat well, a variety of things. It depends again on the species, but the, the pretty keen on, on small rodents and mice and voles and that type of thing. So that's that's what um, the uh, the commonest owl in this country is the tawny owl. That's what they feed on a lot. And as I say, they use their hearing a lot in order to, to locate them. Um, actually, where I come from, there's a few um, uh, gliss gliss or the edible dormice. And there's an awful lot of owls around that area, I seem to think they've fattened themselves up on these yeah. edible dormice, <laughs> which are introduced species. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, another question, have you ever seen a black red start? Actually, I have to confess, no, I have not. Oh, um, okay. No. I'd like to, yes. So. Mm. Um, and one, one last question, and it's one that I'm asking uh, all of our experts this week is do you have mm -hmm. a top wildlife spot or is there something that you haven't seen yet but would really like to see? Wow, there's a million things I haven't seen yet that I'd really yeah. like to. Um, <laughs> if you need a top, top um, spot locally that people can go to, I'm a big fan of, well, Wiccan Fen and Burwell Fen are good, but mm -hmm. um, Wood Walton Fens is my favourite. Um, yeah. uh, you can pretty much rely on seeing all 10 species of warblers there in the spring. Yeah. There's long-eared owls, there's cranes, there's bitterns, there's you, wow. you name it. You don't quite know what you're going to see. Yeah. So, um, but um, what else would I like? Picothartes. I'd like to go and see a Picothartes in West Africa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic. So thank you so much for that. It's been really wonderful hearing all your bird song recordings and, uh, like I say, such a lovely film at Wick and Fen. I love going to Wick and Fen. Um, Oh, there's one more question, just in case there's time. Uh, how do birds remember their songs? This is from Zoe, age seven. Wow, that's a, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, right, well, there's two types of birds. There's the birds that, um, that need to remember their song, the birds that learn their songs um, by listening to other birds. They usually have a sort of idea of the type of thing they're listening for, but um, they need to listen to other birds and, and to, to do that, all the sort of elaborate things that uh, they and to get it really right. And sometimes the females are judging them on how accurately they can reproduce the, the local dialect. Um, so um, that's quite an interesting thing. But then there's another group of birds 
for who, who ha don't have the same circuitry in their brains um, and can't learn it, so they they're born with it. So a cuckoo doesn't learn its song; it just it just cuckoos as soon as it's old enough. Yeah. Yeah. And um, sorry, just one last one as well. Have you ever heard the voice of a barn owl? And although they're silent flyers, so are they actually silent flyers? Oh, yeah, very nearly silent flyers. Yes, they're very, very quiet. I remember I had one flew over a microphone that I had rigged up once, and it flew about two feet above it, and I didn't hear a thing. <laughs> so, so disappointed. Wow. <laughs> but yes, they, they they make a strange kind of hissing sound. It's eerie, or weird. Sound. You wouldn't even think it was a a bird. Quite honestly, it's sort of <laughs> sort of sound like that. It stops yeah. very abruptly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Brilliant. So I think uh, we've got a lot of people there who are, um, and uh, what type of food do certain birds like to eat as well? I think this is one that Andrew will probably talk about a little bit more later as well, but I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to answer that. Well, um, there's obviously birds of prey like eating mice and, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and birds with lots of conical beaks tend to eat seeds. Um, like sparrows, for instance, and finches, and then mm. birds with long, thin beaks tend to eat insects. Um, oh. Yeah, and they tend to migrate because insects die out in the winter. Yeah, ah, very. That's a useful tip for what to okay. look out for as well. <laughs> that's great. Thank you very much for joining us, and like I say, really fascinating. It's a pleasure. And I'm going to keep trying to learn more bird songs. I'm determined to do it during lockdown. So I'm going to. Oh, you should. You get a lot more out of our work in the country, <laughs> yes. right? You do. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So one thing that's been really uh, lifting my spirits during the last few months has been watching the birds in the garden. And Andrew Bladen has put together a film for us showing some top tips on how to attract more birds into your garden. And remember, Andrew will be joining us live after his film. So do uh, put your questions for Andrew in the comments on YouTube. My name's Andrew Bladen and I'm a research associate in the Department of Zoology. Now today I'm going to give you some tips for how you can attract birds to your garden. Obviously larger gardens are really good because they've got lots of space for birds to find food and shelter. But even in small urban gardens, or even if you've just got a balcony, there are still some things you can do to attract the birds in. Probably the easiest way to attract birds to the garden is to provide some food. And what kind of food you put out will affect what kind of birds you attract. High energy seeds such as sunflower seeds in these feeders, or as these no mess hearts, will attract birds such as tits and finches, whilst insect based food such as these dried mealworms will attract blackbirds and robins. You can also get suet based food such as these balls or these nibbles, which will attract basically anything. We found that the starlings particularly love them. Some people get annoyed by starlings taking so much of the food they put out, but if you are lucky enough to have starlings in your garden, it's great to encourage them. They are in decline nationally and have disappeared from many cities, so don't resent giving them a bit of a helping hand. How you provide food will also affect what kind of birds you attract. Tits and finches, and other rarer birds such as woodpeckers and nuthatches, will prefer to come to seed feeders like these, or these kind of feeders designed for fat balls. Whereas blackbirds and robins prefer to feed from the ground or from bird tables. If you have space, try to offer a range of foods in a range of different locations to draw in as many species as possible. When talking about putting out food, it's important to mention bread. Contrary to popular belief, bread isn't particularly good for birds. It's relatively low energy, and it doesn't contain any protein. So it tends to fill birds up without providing anything that they need. In particular, when it gets wet, bread can also get stuck in birds' throats, making it difficult for them to swallow. So it's best to avoid putting bread out altogether. There are lots of places that you can buy bird food from, but it's probably best if you want to get high quality food for your birds, to buy it from conservation charities such as the RSPB or the Wildlife Trust. They'll only provide high quality food that's really good for birds and the profits will go back into nature conservation at the same time. People also often ask if you need to feed birds all year round. Now obviously in winter when natural food is scarce it's really important to feed the birds because the extra food supply will really help them out. But even in spring and summer it could be really important to provide extra food. This is when the birds are feeding chicks and under the most pressure to find as much food as possible. So anything extra that you could provide can really help them out. And from your point of view, it can be really lovely to see those young birds coming into the garden for the first time. 
This year we've had blue tits, blackbirds, robins and starlings and just this morning a family of young reds come into the garden for the first time. Along with food, birds also need something to drink. If you have a space, creating a pond in your garden is a great way to provide water for birds and also a home for lots of other aquatic animals. But if you've got a smaller garden, then having a bird bath or even a tray of water is still a great source of water for the birds. Now a really important thing is to keep these topped up at all times. In the summer, obviously, water can dry out very quickly, but in the winter they can freeze over and if either of these things happen, then the water's no longer there for the birds. So make sure that you take the time to keep filling up the water in the summer and defrosting it in the winter so the birds have always got something to drink. In spring and summer, you can obviously provide nest boxes for birds to use for breeding. Birds nest in all sorts of different places, so there are lots of different nest box designs designed to reflect birds' differing requirements. Standard nest boxes such as these, with small holes, will be used by blue tits and great tits, while nest boxes with larger holes will be used by things like robins. Other species, such as house sparrows, tend to nest communally, and so boxes for them tend to be larger and have three separate chambers next to each other. You can also think about providing nest boxes for species that won't actually land in your garden. Swallows, house martins and swifts all like to nest under the eaves of houses and bespoke nest box designs for them can be fitted to the outside of your house to provide nesting opportunities for these aerial visitors. Sighting nest boxes is really important. It's best to have them facing either north or east so they don't get too much sun and the birds inside don't get too hot. It's also good if they have a small overhang and if possible angle them slightly downwards so that the rain doesn't get in. And if you have a lot of cats in the area, adding a latch to the top can help to prevent break-ins. As with bird food, if you're unsure what kind of nest box to buy, shop with wildlife conservation charities, where the staff will be able to help advise you on the best design for the species that you're interested in helping. And also the profits from your sale will go straight back into nature conservation. With all of these things, it's really important to keep them clean. Bird feeding stations in particular can be a major source of disease, so it's important to keep all of your feeding trays and bird baths nice and clean. All you need is a bucket of warm soapy water, just make sure that you rinse off all of the soap sods before you put them back out again. With nest boxes, obviously it's important not to disturb the birds when they're breeding, in fact it's illegal to do so. Birds can have up to two or even three broods in a year, so wait until the autumn to try and clear out their nest boxes. Empty out the old nests and any unhatched eggs, and give them a thorough clean. Make sure they're fully dry before you put them back up and then leave them there ready for the next year. This can help to prevent the build up of parasites which live in the nest and climb onto the young birds while they're in there. Wildlife appreciates wild spaces. So in addition to providing artificial nest boxes, food and water supplies, it's important to create other patches around the garden where birds can find food and shelter. Growing wildflowers or herbs, which attract lots of invertebrates, will in turn attract lots of birds. Leaving areas of the garden messy, in particular on your borders, having piles of leaves throughout the autumn and winter, and leaving areas of lawn unmowed will also help to create lots of space where birds can find food and shelter. For example, wrens are thought to be one of the most widespread birds in the country, and yet they're rarely seen in gardens because they're so secretive. So by providing places where they can go and hide, you can make sure they've got space to live in your garden, and then you can just set yourself the challenge of getting out there and seeing them. A major threat to garden birds, in fact all garden wildlife, are herbicides, pesticides and slug pellets. Although they don't kill birds directly, they'll kill the invertebrates that birds are feeding on, therefore reducing the amount of food that's available. Even applying herbicide to a lawn can reduce the number of earthworms living within it, and that's bad news for birds like robins and blackbirds that feed on them. If birds do eat poison food, then the toxins can build up in their bodies, and over time, this can kill them. So keep your garden organic and wildlife friendly, and let the birds and predatory invertebrates do the pest control for you. I thought it was important to finish with a word about cats. Lots of wildlife lovers have their own little domestic beast at home, and we're no different, but cats do pose a threat to birds and other garden wildlife. One option is to keep your cat indoors, but if you are going to let them out, make sure that they've got a bell or three on their collar so that birds get some warning when they're trying to hunt them. The other thing is that it's really important to keep cats indoors at night. This is when they're most prone to hunting, and also when birds are asleep and therefore most vulnerable to predation. So by keeping your cat indoors at night, and by only letting them out with a bell on during the day, you can greatly reduce the risk to wildlife in your own garden and elsewhere. <coughs> Thank you.
I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of our garden and the tips to help you attract birds to yours. You can find more information on gardening for wildlife on the Museum of Zoology blog and also on the websites of charities such as the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, Butterfly Conservation and Bug Life. And if you want to share the images of what you've seen in your garden, you can find us on Twitter, at Zoology Museum, and use the hashtag OpenYourWindowBingo. Thank you, Andrew, for that really, really informative film. So we've been joined now by Dr. Andrew Bladen. Um, and I've Hi, Rod. I've got a few questions already, but I'm going to start off um, oh, with wow. one finally. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just saying that the, the birds in your films are really beautiful, and that baby wren is just the cutest thing. Um, it was adorable, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favourite bird that you like to see in the garden? I think I think probably actually the wrens take that. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're as I said in the film, they're really secretive, and it's quite common actually that people don't realise they've got wrens living in their gardens, because they tend to spend their time sort of skulking around in the bottom of bushes and in the borders, and they're so small and well camouflaged that it's quite difficult to see them. Um, and actually, linking back into what Tony was talking about, the one of the easiest ways to tell that you've got a wren is by listening for its song, um, because they are phenomenally loud. Um, and, and quite distinctive. Um, so I, if, if you if you hear a wren singing, it's really hard to believe that the sound they're making is coming from something that small. Um, but they're yeah they're they're just they're really entertaining to watch. They've got quite a funny sort of zipping little flight, um, and yeah, the challenge of spotting them uh, makes them makes them all the more fun to see. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a question from Avril, age eight. What type of food should we be putting on our bird table? And Rob K asks, what should I put on the bird table in my front garden? Usually we get dunnocks. So do you have any recommendations of what should go on the bird table? Yeah, so, so the sort of food you put out will impact uh, the sort of species that you attract. Um, so so insect-based food will tend to attract in things that that eat insects. Um, so things like mealworms um, are very good for dunnocks, blackbirds, uh, robins, um, starlings. Um, and then if you put out seeds, you can put out things like sunflower seeds, um, which will attract in seed eaters like finches um, and sparrows and things. So it depends a little bit on what you want to see. Um, generally, I suppose a lot of the seed feeding birds will come to feeders um, and, and you know you tend to get feed is designed for seeds, uh, whereas more of the insect eating birds won't go to feeders so easily. So things like donnocks and, and blackbirds prefer to feed from the ground, um, but they will go to bird tables. So we tend to put things like um, mealworms and those buggy nibbles that I showed mm -hmm. um, on, on, bird, on the bird table because that brings in, that brings in blackbirds and starlings and things. Um, but it, it does very much depend kind of what you want to attract. I think the thing the thing to probably caution against putting on bird tables um, is peanuts um, because they're good for birds, they're quite high energy um, and they like them, um, but because they're quite big uh, they the adult birds will tend to break them up but there is a worry that they'll sometimes try and feed nuts that are too large yeah. to their chicks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, but so you but you can get dedicated peanut feeders that have a sort of fine enough mesh in that mm -hmm. the peanuts will stay in there, and therefore the birds have to break them up in the process of getting them out. So that's yeah. probably the best way to provide peanuts if you want to put peanuts out. Okay, and uh, just going back to one of the questions we asked Tony, I was wondering who had an answer for um, a recommendation for the best place to put a bird hide. Do you have any recommendations? No. Oh. Um, yeah, well, I mean, as as Tony said, it sort of it sort of depends what you want to see and what kind of space you've got as well. So, um, something with a focal point is, you know, if you if you go to an RSPB reserve or or another wildlife reserve, you'll find that they they put the hides in front of a focal point because they've got something to draw the birds in. Um, so, I, in that sense, you could put up a hide anywhere, and then if you put some feeders outside it, hopefully the birds will come. Um, but as Tony said, something like a water source is really good because it provides that focal point that mm -hmm. lots of birds need. Um, I mean, it, the thing that I find is that actually houses work really well as default bird hides because essentially the hide, the hide itself doesn't have to be concealed. It just, mm -hmm. it's just a structure um, that 
that birds get used to being there. So it's a when you see wildlife filmmakers go out and you know they'll hide themselves in a really well camouflaged hide to film something really rare, that's because they want to blend into the environment because they're putting something new in the environment. But something that's going to be permanent, like a bird hide or, or, or a house, the birds very rapidly get used to, and they don't notice you if you're inside. So you can stand at your kitchen window and watch a bird just outside it, and if you move, if, as long as you don't move too quickly, they won't notice you're, that you're there, and you've got you know your house becomes a ready-made bird hide. Oh, that's a good tip, good tip there. <laughs> so, uh, Wenjia Knight asks, uh, what do turkeys like to eat? Do you know what turkeys like Turkeys? To eat? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would imagine they, they're, they're mostly grain. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so seed um, and cereal grain, uh, because that's what, that's what most sort of game birds, um, turkeys and chickens and partridges and things will eat there. Uh, they might eat a few insects as well, um, but mm -hmm. most, mostly seed. Yeah. And Josh, age seven, why do birds build nests? Uh, to provide to provide somewhere safe uh, for their for their young to grow up, and, and often in some senses to, to provide somewhere to kind of contain the the eggs. Um, but birds have different strategies. So um, birds like woodpeckers um, and uh, uh, blue tits and things will build nests in trees. Um, and they'll find holes in trees and owls do the same thing. And the reason that they do that is because it's a sort of safe, safe contained space. The eggs aren't in danger of kind of rolling off or, or whatever. It's protected from the weather. Um, and it makes it harder for predators to get in. Um, so if it's a nice small hole that the bird can just fit through, um, then it makes it harder for any, any predators to get in and eat the eggs or the chicks. Um, but some birds will nest um, up in trees um, but kind of out in the open and so in that case they need a structure there to be able to lay their eggs in and support them um, so that they don't fall out and what you find is the birds that nest in other places so birds that nest on the ground um, often don't build that much of a nest at all it will sort of be you know they might hollow out a little depression um, that the, the eggs will stay in but they don't they don't need to bother building as much around it and some seabirds actually don't build nests at all they just lay an egg on the, they just find a patch of rock on the cliff face and just lay an egg on it. <laughs> um, the guillemots just don't bother. Yeah. <laughs> but then they're but then they're birds that are going out to sea, mm -hmm. so they don't really have the materials around. They mm -hmm. you know they're not going to find leaves and sticks out at sea that they can use to, to build or to line a nest. Yeah. Um, Evelyn, aged seven, asks, "What bird would you usually find in the garden?" Um, so that will depend a little bit where you live, um, but uh, in most places in the UK, uh, you'll often find robins and blackbirds, um, wood pigeons, um, the birds that, that tend to be the most commonly recorded. Um, so uh, the RSPB do an annual Big Garden Bird Watch survey where they get people to, to watch the birds in their garden and, and send in records. Um, and they, uh, the, the most common birds on there tend to be uh, blue tits, house sparrows and starlings because they're found across the country um, and they'll come to bird feeders um, and, and, and also partly because they're quite easy for people to identify. Um, but then you know it, it depends where you live so I, I know that you get people who live if you live on the coast um, and you've got a garden that sort of backs onto the sea you can get weird things like oyster catchers in your garden and you know nobody would think of an oyster catcher as being a garden bird but you know <laughs> It can be depending on where you are, um, and if you if you live next to a woodland, you're much more likely to get woodpeckers and nuthatches and things coming into the garden. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. It's so it nice depends on the habitat today. that's around a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. another question, and I think this one might need some jargon explaining as well. If you had to see any passerine, what would it be? So can you explain to us what a passerine is as well? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, so passerines are most of the of the most common birds that you would think of as being garden birds will come under passerines. So, the, so it's a group of birds. Uh, the name comes, it means perching bird. So, so birds that perch. Um, so the things that are passerines are things like um, blackbirds and thrushes, um, all of the tits and finches, uh, the crows and other corvids uh, are all passerines. Um, things that aren't passerines um, that don't tend to perch um, are things like seabirds, so so gulls and terns, uh, ducks and divers, waders, mm -hmm. um, birds of prey and the owls, 
um, and game birds, so things like partridges, they're not passerines. Um, and the, the other sort of broad distinction between them is that most of the birds that we think of as being songbirds are passerines, and most of the birds that are not songbirds and don't tend to sing are non-passerines. The slight, the, the crows are probably the weird ones in that because mm -hmm. they don't really have a song as such, but they are passerines, they're technically songbirds. Um, so what kind of passerine would I most like to see? Uh, that's pretty tough. Um, often, I right? would say, actually, I actually, I, I think yeah, I probably do know the answer to this. Um, I have uh, what what birders tend to refer to as a bogey bird, uh, which is a bird that is relatively common, um, but which you've never managed to see. Mm -hmm. um, and my bogey bird is the waxwing, um, which is a winter visitor to the UK. Uh, so you won't see it this time of year. It breeds up in Siberia, um, and it uh, but it comes here in the winter because we have a warmer winter than um, than Scandinavia and Siberia. So it comes here to to escape the real freezing cold up there, um, and it feeds on berry bushes. Um, and you get some years where years where there aren't very many, and some years where there are quite a lot. Um, and they come uh, and they come and feed on berries in gardens. And the best place to see them is East Anglia. Um, you get years where there are a lot of them around Cambridge, Cambridgeshire um, and Bedfordshire and Norfolk. Um, and despite having lived over here for 10 years, I've never seen a wax <laughs> waxwing. Despite having been in places where, I, where other people have seen waxwings, I always seem to miss them. Um, and, and they're really pretty little birds. They're sort of a, a, a slightly reddy sort of colour and they've got really nice yellow markings on their wings. So they're really pretty. Um, and I've never seen one. Uh, so that's... <laughs> That's my that's, that's my bird I most want to see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sean's asking for the swift foxes. Is it only worth putting these up if you're in the right area, i.e., near the countryside, or is it also worth putting these boxes up if you live in the suburbs, for example? It's definitely worth putting them up in the suburbs as well. Yeah. Um, so so swifts are very wide ranging. Um, they'll they'll travel quite a long way to feed. So um, if if you get a, a Day of bad weather in the UK, swifts that are nesting in in England might fly all the way over to France to go and feed, and then, mm. and then come back again because they fly very quickly. Um, and if there's better weather over there, they'll they'll go and do that. So they will seek out new places. Yeah. Um, and actually, swifts like nesting in cities, in towns and cities, because they ne because they nest up on buildings. Mm. They're the sort of places that they're looking for. So um, if you go into the centre of Cambridge, you can see and hear swifts flying around all over the place um, because they're nesting up in in some of the old buildings where you've got sort of holes in holes in some of the stonework and things um, so so I think swift boxes you can put up kind of wherever um, and, and towns and cities are definitely just as good if not probably even better than in the countryside yeah because we have swift boxes don't we on the museum building on the David Attenborough building yes, yes. yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and you have the slightly confusing thing of the fact so so swifts like to nest communally Mm -hmm. um, so they'll be attracted into nest by the sound of other swifts. Um, and so when uh, people put swift nest boxes in buildings, particularly big buildings, uh, one of the things they do, which they do in the museum building, is play the calls of swifts during the summer when the swifts are here to try and make them think there are other birds nesting there and draw them in. So actually, if you wander around the museum when it's open um, in the summer, you'll hear swifts all the time, but most of the time it's a recording. <laughs> uh, but there are some yeah. real ones up there as well. Oh, it's good to hear that they're, they're starting to get used. Um, so yeah. another question, this is one that I can relate to. Uh, I've only been able to put out fat balls because those are the only feeders that can keep the squirrels off. They'll empty a feeder in a day. Any hints for stopping them so I can increase the range? Yeah, um, that is a common problem. But that's one of the reasons why, why I really like fat balls as well, actually, because the squirrels don't, don't tend to bother with them. Um, so there are a few different things you can do. One, which is perhaps the most fancy, which is something we have that I didn't actually show on the screen, on the film. I don't know whether you can see this. Yeah. So this is um, a, a normal sort of shape feeder. Um, but on the outside, I don't know whether you can see, it's got this kind of cage on it. Mm -hmm. um, and the only access point is down, down here where you've got the perches. Um, so the birds can land on the perch and because they're quite light, they'll just land in there and feed in from the side. But the top moves and drops down. So if so, so if a squirrel perches on the side, this, this will oh, drop down and then it can't get in to access the feed. And this actually works amazingly well. 
um, the, the squirrels the, the squirrels can't get into this. The only thing you have to be careful of, which is um, which is true of all feeders actually, is you've got to have it kind of hanging far enough away from anything else they can perch on. Mm -hmm. So we had this hanging on the um, on a bracket that was on the wall of our house outside the kitchen. Um, and I actually saw a squirrel just, I thought, well, that's fine, they won't be able to get up there. It just climbed up the wall and <laughs> so, so worked out that if it stood on the wall, it could lean in and still and still access the food. So you have to have it kind of hanging far enough away um, yeah. on a sort of long branch of a tree or a pole or something. But there are other things you can do as well. So um, uh, RSPB and other places will sell these kind of uh, plastic domes. Mm -hmm. that you can have over your feeder that can stop them coming down to them. And again, that relies on the feeder being far enough away um, mm -hmm. that, that they can't get in from the side. Um, and something which we've tried, and I, I don't have proof that it works, but certainly since we did it, I've not seen a squirrel on our feeders. So we have on the film I showed um, uh, a pole that we have in the garden with mm -hmm. some feeders hanging off it. And a couple of mornings we woke up to find a squirrel leaning in to get some get some food and we tried rubbing some vegetable oil on the outside of the pole to make it stick the only way they could get it was by climbing up the pole and since we put it on there we've not found we've not seen any squirrels go up there and the rate of seed going down has decreased dramatically so yeah. it seems yeah. like that might be work as well so if you've got a freestanding pole that you've got your bird feeders hanging from um vegetable oil liberally mm -hmm spread all of it might actually give them a greasy pole okay. to climb and they can't manage it <laughs> good tip um so toby age nine if my neighbor's gardens attract lots of birds how can i encourage some to visit mine uh well i guess you've got to you you've got two options really i suppose you try and rival them <laughs> so you see what they if they're putting out if they're putting out lots of food um i guess you could try putting out some food too um, and see if they'll pop across to yours when they've um, eaten everything in your neighbour's garden. Um, you could also try providing something different. Um, so again, if they're, if they're putting out food but they're not providing water, then putting out something like a bird bath might be a really good way of the birds will go next door for the food and then come to you for a drink afterwards. Um, and the other thing is that um, birds often don't particularly like nesting close by to where they're feeding so mm -hmm. um we we don't have a huge amount of success with the nest boxes in our garden i think probably because we've got quite a small garden and so many birds in there feeding all the time um mm -hmm. that they that they don't you know nothing wants to nest in there because there, there's too much other activity around but there are definitely birds that nest just over the fence uh, we've got a little area of grass out the back of our garden and they there are definitely things that are nesting in the bushes and the trees out there um so if you're next door to a garden that provides a lot of food maybe put up some nest boxes and see if oh. you can get them to nest in your garden oh top tips here this is brilliant um sean's asking is it a bad idea to put up more than one nest box in your garden e.g in terms of competition um I, potentially uh yes so i, I I mean, it depends on the size of your garden. If you've got a big garden, you can probably get away with, with lots of nest boxes well spaced. Um, if you've got a small garden, uh, then probably having lots of nest boxes of the same style will lead to them not all getting used. So robins in particular are really territorial. So if you've got a robin in your garden, it it will not let another another robin in. Um, you know, if, you, if you see more than one, it's probably a pair or it's, or it's some young or you're about to see a fight. Um, so in a small garden there's probably not a lot of point in having more than one robin box um, and to an extent the same will be true for for other species but um, they tend to be much less territorial with different species because they're not in competition with them in the same way so if you put up a box that's suitable for robins and a box that's suitable for blue tits and a box that's suitable for great tits um, then you know you might be lucky and get get more than one of them occupied and certainly if you're putting up things the more different things like the the swift boxes or the or the swallow boxes that we showed um then you know they they won't be in competition at all with the birds in your garden so so they're sort of exclusive and <laughs> um, so i've got another one from everline and um, if you wake up early and check in your garden will you find a lot of birds or not so much is it worth getting up early uh you'll probably i think so yeah mm. 
Um, I, de I definitely think you'll you'll see more. Um, so birds tend to be most active at the start of the day. Uh, so if you're going out doing bird surveys, um, then then all of the guidance is that you should get up as early as possible. Um, or, you know, so you start the survey just after dawn, um, just as it's light, um, and then you try and finish by the middle of the day because that's when birds are least active and and they'll all you know they'll be hunkering down somewhere. Um, so yeah, if you get up early you'll almost certainly see more, you'll almost certainly hear more. Um, and that's when there'll be the most activity out there. And she's also asking, um, why can't the squirrels eat too? They also need food. I guess we're being a bit harsh by saying that. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I, it, it's, it, it's very much up to the person who is paying for the bird food, I think. Um, so <laughs> um, there's no problem with the squirrels eating if you can afford to keep up with their uh, with the, with their rate of intake. So so um, if if bird food were free, I think none of us would mind. But the, but because you have to buy it, um, uh, it it gets a lot more expensive. The squirrels empty it every day um, yeah. compared to the, sort of the rate that the birds will go through it. Yeah. Although that said, a flock of starlings will demolish things pretty quickly <laughs> as well. Um, Gilby, aged 11, is asking, what's your favourite bird of prey? Do you have a favourite bird of prey? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. I think probably red kites. Um, and I'll tell you why. So when I, when I was growing up, um, red kites were really, really rare in the UK. Um, so unfortunately, they were persecuted for a long time. Um, because people saw them as a pest um, and so they they eventually went extinct in England and Scotland um, and they were only found in a small area in Wales um, in, in, in sort of the 1980s um, and in the early 90s um, they were reintroduced to uh, the Chilterns in Oxfordshire and it was just a small population and I can still remember seeing my first red kite as I, uh, from a car actually, we were driving along, red kites have a really distinctive uh, V-shaped tail, which they're the only bird of prey in the UK that has this, mm. this fork in the tail. Um, so if you see their outline, they're really obvious. Um, and I saw it from a car when I was about eight, um, and I was like, I think that looked like a red kite. And then I looked at my bird book, and the only place that you could see red kites was whales, and then this tiny little green dot on the map that was about where we were on the motorway. <laughs> um, and, and so since then, as, as you travel around, um, you know, particularly central England, they've slowly expanded. Um, and so mm. we now, you know, I've seen them in our, in our village in Cambridgeshire, um, and, and you, you see them all across uh, Bedfordshire and, and Northamptonshire and up into the Midlands and down towards London. Um, and, it, and it's fantastic. It's a real kind of conservation success story to see them spread. Um, and they're wonderful birds to watch because they'll fly quite low. So if you get up on a bit of a hill, you can often get to a point where you're level with them or above them, and you can watch how they're sort of dancing on the wind. Um, and and they're a lovely sort of rusty red colour as well, which is really really nice. Um, so I think they're probably my favourite. Yeah, sounds brilliant. Um, Josh, age seven, uh, do birds return to the same nest each year? Uh, it depends. Uh, a lot of birds won't. No, um, a lot of birds will will build new nests, um, but some birds do do sometimes go back to the, certainly to the same. A, a lot of migratory birds will go back to the same area. So swallows will often return to the same barn to breed, um, and in some cases they will use they will use the same nest year on year. Um, it there tends to be a bit of a, a correlation between how much effort they put into building the nest with how likely they are to reuse it. Um, so the species I was talking about, things that don't really build much of a nest, won't bother. They'll just find somewhere different because it's better um, to, to sort of um, not have a build-up of parasites um, in a nest um, and to not have the risk of predators knowing where they are. Um, but swallows and house martins and things build these mud cups um, on the sides of buildings and things. And it takes quite a lot of effort and energy by the parents to to slowly build that nest and so once it's built it's much more worth their time to reuse it um, than to try and you know take that extra energy to go and build a new one um, and a lot of birds of prey do the same thing as well so things like um, eagles and ospreys and stuff 
um, will go back to they build these massive nests because obviously they're quite big birds and their chicks are quite big um, with with big sticks and twigs um, and they'll go back year on year and they'll just add a few to them um, and so you can go to play if you go to um, Loch Garton which is uh, one of the RSPB's reserves in Scotland which was one of the places the last places that ospreys were found before they started to, to spread out again mm -hmm. um, and they've got big old nests there that, that they just layer on year on year and so the nest ends up being really really deep because mm -hmm. the birds are just adding to it but it will often be the same bird because they're quite long lived the same bird goes back to it year after year and then eventually mm -hmm. that individual dies or, or gets kicked out by someone else and then they'll take over for 10 years or something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, so some surprising. birds will use the same nest again, yeah. but others others don't bother. Yeah. And um, another question: Do you see birds every day? Yes, yes. Yeah. If you look for them, definitely. Um, so we we get birds in our garden every day. Um, I, I, you know, we go out for a walk every day, and I'm always kind of looking out for what's around, looking for something new, um, or or just sort of you know seeing the common things again. So yeah. If birds, I, th I think the reason that birds are so popular is that they're so easy to see. You can see them year round um, and you can always spot something. So, so if you get outside and, and look up, you will see, you will see some birds. Yeah. yeah. I've got two related questions here. The first is, well, actually it's three, where do, bird, where do swifts get their names? Is it because they're fast? And then James, age seven, is asking, how fast is a swift? Ooh. They're both good questions, and I don't actually know the answer to either of them. Um, I have always kind of assumed that swifts are called swifts because they're quite swift. Mm -hmm. um, but I have no idea whether that's actually the case. Um, so so I, I don't know. Um, how fast can they fly? Um, I also have no idea. Yeah, actually, I'm not sure. They're not, they're not, I, I know they're not the fastest bird. Um, in the world, because that mm -hmm. record goes to the peregrine falcon, um, because they but the peregrine falcon cheats a little bit, uh, because the way it gets the the top speed is they they circle around really high and they hunt mm -hmm. pigeons, um, so they'll fly above pigeons and then when they see one they want to hunt they just drop, um, and mm -hmm. so they'll they'll sort of hurtle out of the sky and hit a pigeon on the back and catch it that way and take it by surprise, um, and so they're using gravity to to get that speed up and they can get up really really fast it's over mm -hmm. well over 100 miles an hour i think um but they're using gravity whereas swifts are not they're generally going horizontally mm -hmm. um so they're they they won't be as fast as that but they're pretty rapid given that they're only going in a horizontal flight but i actually don't know how fast my guess would be probably up to 60 or 70 miles an hour if they if they're right. really yeah. really going but i don't yeah. know yeah oh We'll try and look it up and um, put it on our social media for you. Yes, um, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and one last question from me, um, and it's one that I'm asking all of our experts this week. You've already mentioned something that you really would like to see, um, and, and something that you haven't seen yet but would really like to. But do you have a top wildlife spot? Is there something that you've seen that you, you think, oh, yeah, that was a really good thing to see? Yeah, so I think, I think my, best, my best spot, uh, was a bird called a secretary bird, um, which yeah. is found in Africa. Um, so I was very lucky. I did my uh, PhD field work in Ethiopia. Um, I was studying a couple of Ethiopian birds, um, and I spent a lot of time out wandering around on on East African plains, um, and saw all sorts of of, of cool things. Um, but the most unexpected thing was I looked up from my survey sheets um, and on the horizon just saw this enormous tall bird wandering across, just kind of, you know, minding its own business. Um, and secretary birds are really, really weird. So they, um, they're actually related to, they're a bird of prey, they're related to buzzards and eagles and things. But rather than being what you'd think of as a bird of prey, uh, you know, large bodied, relatively short legs and spending most of their time flying around, they've actually evolved really long legs they're not very good flyers and they spend most of their time just wandering around on on the ground um, and they hunt reptiles and amphibians and small mammals and, and, and insects and things um, but they're they're one of those things that's sort of quite widespread but not very common anywhere 
So I, they're re they'd be really tricky to kind of go to, it would be hard to go somewhere and be like, oh, I can go here to see them. Mm -hmm. Because there's nowhere, I, I don't think there would be anywhere that you'd like, you'd really reliably go to see them. It's, it's very much chance. And so uh, just kind of happening across one that was wandering along, you know, a few hundred meters away was a real surprise. Um, and yeah, pro probably one of the most exciting things I've ever, I've ever seen. Oh, I'm very jealous. I'd love to see that. That sounds great. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was really, really fascinating and uh, some really good top tips as well. I'm going to start putting those in action here. So thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So this week we've been setting a series of challenges for you and today is no different. Um, today you can find out how to take part in our Lego Creature Challenge. Hello, I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. You would usually see us at the Museum of Zoology. While we've been staying safe at home, we have rediscovered our love for creating things, particularly using Lego. This week for Zoology Live, we challenge you to build an animal that you have seen recently using Lego bricks. Matt, are you ready to give it a go? OK, here we go. I've made a butterfly, complete with proboscis and warning eye spots on its wings. I've been seeing a lot of these out and about on sunny days, so why not give it a go and create some wildlife that you've seen? Excellent stuff. We would love to see what you've created, so please do share photos of your creations with us via social media using the hashtag ZoologyLive or by emailing them to umzc at zoo.cam.ac.uk. These will be entered into a prize draw to win a wildlife exploration kit on Monday the 29th of June. But come back on Saturday the 27th of June to see all of the makes sent through during the week. Good luck! It's been really wonderful seeing some of you take part in our Zoology Live uh, Wildlife Challenge on iRecord. If you haven't done so yet, there's still time to join up, but it's free to join and really simple to do. You can find instructions on how to take part on our blog. We'd really love to see any of your creations this week as well, so any of your recycled or nature or Lego makes, please do send us pictures of those. If you use the hashtag Zoology Live on our social media, or you can email them as well. You can find out details on how to take part in these challenges on our blog. Uh, any entries into our recycled makes and Lego creature challenges will also be entered into a prize draw for a mini beast explorer kit, so it's really well worth doing. We'd also love to know what you think of what we've been doing this week on Zoology Live, so do fill in our survey, you can find a link to it in the show notes below. And join us tomorrow when we will be exploring nighttime wildlife with bat expert Henry Stanier and moth expert Annette Shelford. <laughs>